Great to have you here on the Clark Howard Show. Our mission is to serve you and empower you so you make better financial decisions in your life. So many people are really unsettled. And in surveys of individual investors, people are really freaked out about the direction of the stock market, money you have in 401ks, Roth IRAs, um, traditional investment accounts. I want to give you a stat to try to calm your fears. And also, you got so many digital accounts. We've got with Apple or Google, in addition to so many other things that we have digital accounts, email of various types and all that. What happens if we inconveniently pass away, what happens to all those things? What prep have you done to prepare for that uh, day that that comes? You know, it actually does show up. And how do you see that your loved ones have access to your digital identity? We're going to talk about that. So this is a session of Clarkonomics. Because at times like this, where there's a lot of nervousness out there. One of my brothers keeps calling me, freaking out. Um, a friend of mine keeps calling me, freaking out. In fact, I talked to him last night about, uh, you know, the, the world's coming to an end financially, and we're going to have just Armageddon coming. That's what my brother thinks financially. And uh, my friend is really worried that the stock market's going to crater, it's going to collapse. So can I answer either of those questions in the short term? No way, not any day. No one can say exactly what's going to happen with the investment market over a short period of time. Over a longer period of time, though, you go back through history and people who just are like me, steady Eddie, putting money consistently, well-diversified, into the stock market here and overseas, overseas is important, and riding through good times and bad times, doing the most basic investing principle, which is dollar cost averaging, where you put money in regardless of what's going on. Rain, sunshine, snow, storms, whatever. I'm trying uh, using that as, what do you call that when you talk about something to explain something else. Is that called a simile? What's that called? A metaphor. A metaphor. Thank you. What's a simile? Uh, God, you're bringing me back. A simile, I think it's something that sounds similar. Oh, so a metaphor. A metaphor So I'm is talking a about the investments, investment community going through stormy conditions, beautiful conditions, all that. And people tend to be all about investing when things are great. And then they run away and hide when things are bad. And so that means you're overpaying for what you get and you're missing opportunity when others are afraid. Now, let me give you an example. So let's say somebody took money, and this is from CNBC. They took money a year ago and put $1,000 into the most common index fund, which is the S&P 500 where you own the 500 largest publicly traded stocks in the U.S. So it's a good representation of stock market value U.S. stocks, although I prefer something known as the total stock market index, which includes a lot more companies, but that's a conversation for a different day. So I put in that $1,000. What do I have now, according to CNBC? I got $942. Now, who wants to put in $1,000 and put it at risk and have less money than you started with a year ago. None of us. But let's go back five years. You put $1,000 in five years ago with all the craziness that's happened, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, COVID, inflation, all that. $1,000 put in five years ago is now worth right at $1,700. $1,000 put in 10 years ago with the ups and downs of the marketplace over these last 10 years, a couple of recessions thrown in there, of course, COVID, um, the war, all that. 
thousand dollars ten years ago is now worth thirty two hundred plus dollars the key with investing is time in the market time in the market not timing the market big difference in concept I hear from people over and over again I'm going to invest when it feels safe what do you miss let's go back in the wayback machine the market collapsed after the banking scandals that became known to us in 2007 and the market went down 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 it went and the market bottomed out way before uh, people's jobs recovered and all that it bottomed out in uh, March or April 2009 depending on how you measure the US economy really didn't truly people in their own lives didn't really truly recover till 2015 but the market was uh, was at its bottom in spring of 2009 people who stayed in and kept going in the market 2009 till today have had a ridiculously great return but that's a tiny percent of people because people got so freaked out they left the market and they missed the giant recovery that started in 2009 remember why you're investing you're not investing for today you're not investing for tomorrow or even next year you're investing that's when you're putting your money at risk is a long-term play and that's why I love for people to put uh, a little bit more than 500 a month every month into a Roth IRA if you can afford to do it and you just keep doing it and Roth IRA you can even make it simpler put in a target retirement fund even better only have your Roth IRA at one of the low-cost companies never 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 not ever there's no exception to this your money should never be in a Roth at a credit union your money and I love credit unions right but not for your investments never 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 not ever should your Roth IRA or traditional IRA be at a bank ever never should never be at an investment operation of a bank because the banks hose you with crazy high fees massive commissions and the people you're dealing with at the bank investment arm they're not fiduciaries they are doing what's best for them and the bank and not what's best for you do your Roth IRA with a discount brokerage or a commission-free mutual fund company period um, you can do exchange traded funds with a discount broker pay no money buying them pay no money selling them I mean it's just great because index funds or exchange traded funds that mimic them as uh, a different version of an index fund they have virtually no expenses in them the really low cost uh, target retirement funds for people who really are just uh, overwhelmed or confused or bored by trying to figure out how to how to allocate your money inside a retirement account just go target retirement fund with a low-cost company and they do the allocating for you based on your age and how far you are from retirement but the big thing is this is one you build a habit with every day who's the most fit the most physically fit people who make a daily habit an ongoing regular habit of exercise on the other hand people who are couch potatoes the health problems accrue over time same thing with investing slow and steady wins the race diversified and you're doing it every single time period whether it's quarterly monthly pay period whatever and that's the philosophy you and Mike live by mm -hmm. with the exercise because you do exercise the two of you like I've never seen no we are okay I'm just gonna take it sure it's true <laughs> it's true I mean you were a college athlete and you oh. 
you've continued <laughs> to be an athlete through your life. And I you, work out for my mental health more than anything, and physical. Which is great, and you do it all the time. And you're the same way with money, just putting it mm -hmm. in. Stay as you go. Since you were how old? Uh, 21. I started my retirement accounts. I started also, my first IRA when I was 19. Of course you did. That's awesome. And my kids both had IRAs when they were 15, which I love. Also, I feel like an idiot. A simile is a comparison using like or as. My English teachers are probably just want to kill me right now. I don't understand what that means. So you're saying it's like you are like a summer's day. Oh, so I was okay like. calling it. And a metaphor is more like it's, they are some, like, this is a storm. They're going through a storm, whatever. So I think what you were doing was a metaphor, but all you English teachers out there can correct me because I feel like an idiot. We're going to start with Aaron. I didn't do that well in English, you can tell. Okay. Aaron in New York says, hi Clark, I've been seeing a lot more articles like this lately where more retirement plans are offering annuities. What options are out there if you want to create a pension type of investment for yourself and he linked to an article. Yeah, so this is going to become more common because federal law changed and permitted this. Here's the problem. People hit retirement age, and let's say they've been really good, diligent uh, savers slash investors over the years in a 401k at their place of work. People then reach the end of their work cycle, and they got this money, and it's overwhelming for so many people to figure out how it should be invested post-retirement from an employer. And one of the big problems we have is people outlive their money. They uh, don't invest as well as they could maybe, and they, don't, and they spend too much of it in the early years of retirement. Later in retirement, they're broke. So this option that's available, and you're gonna see more of it available, is where you end the retirement plan you have from your employer You'll have an option often inside a target retirement fund like Fidelity now offers with their plans where you can annuitize your money at time of retirement, meaning you take it and you turn it into a lifetime stream of income for the rest of your life, a pension, or you can designate for yourself and your spouse, and then you get a smaller monthly check because it lasts for both of your lifetimes. Now you hear me call annuities a cuss word, right? But this kind of annuity is one that salespeople aren't excited to sell you and they're not part of this process anyway because there's not really any room for commissions in these. And when you buy these through one of these employer plans, um, somebody may mess these up along the way, but in theory, there will be um, no extreme overhead at all. Your money will just uh, go to work for you, turning it into the equivalent of a pension. And this is a great strategy for someone who's not worried about kids inheriting money someday. And you just want to make sure that you will have financial comfort in your life, knowing you're going to get that check month after month, as long as you might live. Chris in California says, in the pandemic era, I was fortunate to keep working, but my spouse was not. With one income, I opened several credit cards that at first I had control on payments. I began to miss payments with rapid succession, and I fell Ooh. behind. Now most of these cards have been written off into collections. I want to honor all my payments. How should I do so? Should I write letters to the creditors and offer payment plans? How can I ensure that if I pay any amounts that these creditors will not resell my debt? Thank you. I'm overwhelmed. Chris, I'm really, really sorry about the circumstance you find yourself in. Obviously, you're going to dig yourself out as you're clear as could be. What's that? I just wanted to say you're not alone, Chris. Yeah. And, and Chris, you recognize the problem. You made no excuses for it. And you want to solve it. And those are all the elements to you getting financially healthy again and getting right with these with these credit card operators. You need an advocate involved for you. And that should be an affiliate of the National Foundation for Credit Counseling. They do this kind of stuff all the time. You go to nfcc.org and find a local one to you, Chris, in California. And they will be able to either come up with a payment plan 
with these creditors that have put you into charge-off status, or they'll negotiate for you what you have to pay to wipe out the debt. Uh, you are right about the problem with debts being sold again and again. That's why getting your arms around this now is really great. And I think you'll find the services, um, I mean, they've any human being, any organization varies in quality. But consistently, I hear such good feedback about people who go to affiliates of the National Foundation for Credit Counseling. And from Rick in California, the information recently repeated, causing, I'm sure, untold numbers of users to panic and change how they charge their phones at public charging stations, trying to avoid being data juiced, is not true. Before passing on these types of stories, you might want to check with the experts. And they link to an article. For information on how this bad device was spread, check before you jump and don't freak out over public charging stations that pose actually no or very low risks. All right. I agree that I hype this too much like just about every media organization in the United States did based on an FBI alert recently about this. So technically, criminals can steal information from your device when you plug it into a USB at a public charging spot like in an airport, hotel, things like that. What I should have said and what I failed to do when I talked about it on the podcast is this is a very rare crime. So yes, it can happen, but of the things for you to worry about in life, I should not have joined the herd and spread it. So the advice I gave I still feel is proper and, ac and accurate. And that is, it is best in a public space to charge at a, an electrical outlet rather than a USB. And I do that. I travel with one that can um, hold multiple devices. It's my own little chargey thing. And I plug it into electricity, and then I have four USBs in it. So I'm controlling the flow, if you will, of electricity to my devices. And it's just um, kind of like a little insurance policy for me. And Krista, there's also a device you can buy that some people like yeah. that protects your device. They're like eight, 10, $12. Right, we heard from a few people that they buy one of these little USB devices that's supposed to block your data. Um, and protect against juice jacking. So I just pulled up one, a two-pack on Amazon for eleven ninety nine. I know you don't want to hear about Amazon. No, that's, but, no, why would yeah. you want to hear about Amazon? Um, so I don't know. We haven't tested these, but we did have several um, audience members, Clark, Team Clark members, reach out to tell us about that so as well. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, discussion, obviously. This one really hit uh, a hot button with people. And I would say that this is a technically possible crime, um, but it's been very rare. And so if you are like, I got enough else to deal with, I'm not going to worry about it, or just do it really simply. Use one of the devices that protects your data or six bucks at Amazon. Or use my thing where you only plug into a electricity. I've got my little device with the four USBs in it. So the point is to be careful, and I really appreciate you sharing the passion of people on this topic. Wasn't it crazy how passionate people were? Um, so I want to talk about something else digital, and that's we have digital lives now. What happens to those digital lives when our actual real life goes away? We're going to talk about that. There are more and more stories that are so sad to me with grieving loved ones unable to retrieve mementos, very precious photos of family members, a loved one who's passed away, whatever. Because when that individual passes away, if nobody knows how to get into their digital life, those pictures die with them. And there are simple precautions we can take. 
And we update this every year. We updated our guide at Clark.com uh, just three months ago to keep it as up to date as possible about how do you protect your digital being when you're no longer here with us so that your loved ones aren't left in a lurch. My wife and I have a procedure we've used for years to ensure that if one of the other of us passed away, the other has the accounts, the usernames, the passwords to be able to get in to various accounts, financial and otherwise, so that the information doesn't end up behind a digital wall. The reality is companies have worked hard to keep people out of our stuff. And when somebody passes away, it's really hard to get through that. So the question I have for you, you're, if you're in the Apple orbit, you're in the Google orbit, who has access? What would happen? What we have in our lives is poor Krista is the one who, under the Google system, is what's known as our inactive account manager. It's Google's cute way of saying, if Lane or I croak, and if we were to die at the same time, uh, Krista's second in command. I didn't know that. I told you that. No, you that. didn't. <laughs> yeah, so it's set up where if uh, Lane dies and I'm still living, I'm her inactive account manager primary if and vice versa. But if both of us were to die simultaneously in a wreck or something. Oh, God forbid. Yeah, you are the one who is who receives access. Okay. Well, I hope I never ever receive that access. I just want to say that. But I want to I want you those of you who watch the uh, video version of the podcast. If you saw you saw Krista and those of you who listen to the audio version, I mean, you just hated this topic right away. Well, it freaked you out. I just want to I'm I'm weird about that stuff. I mean, I know we have to talk about these things and it's very important and I've laid out my own stuff too. I'm with you. But, you know, let's just say it quick and I don't want to no, think no, about I mean, that happening. No, no, I mean, it's a fact. I mean, it's we people put this kind of stuff off forever and then forever turns out to be too late because then that stuff gets locked away and um you know apple is uh really really super focused on making that information not available to anyone and with apple you got to make sure because in the wall street journal story they talk over and over again about how people when somebody else is doesn't have access to their Apple stuff and somebody dies, Apple just will not cooperate. That stuff is not available. And you really got to think about uh, what often in the industry is called emergency access. And so how, how are you doing that for your financial accounts? How are you doing that for your digital life with Apple and or Google? And I know it's an uncomfortable topic. It's a necessary topic to deal with. I have a sheet that lays out for Lane that I update once a year on my birthday. How ironic is that on my birthday? I update, um, you know, I look through the list and I see if anything, any usernames, passwords, any accounts that don't exist anymore are removed, any new accounts are added. And in the event of my demise, whenever that is, she has access and vice versa. And I hope that you and Mike have done this as well. Um, no? We have yeah. a shared password manager account. Um, and I have emailed to my father um, different ways to get into our accounts too, just in case he ever needed to. Okay. And you mentioned the next thing I was going to say. You anticipate everything in this brain, <laughs> don't you? Mind meld. Is a lot of people do this through password managers. Uh, like uh, use LastPass, mm -hmm. and there are a variety of these available, and then you've got access to it. Um, one of them calls it their emergency kit, but 
this is something I know that is uncomfortable, like when I talk about the ways to save on funerals and people freak out that I'm talking about it like I'm talking about the weather. But um, these things happen. People do pass away. And being prepared is so much better than ignoring it and dealing with trying to figure out how to do it, deal with something on the fly. So uh, if death is uncomfortable for you, I apologize. We're all going to have this happen at some point. It's one of the things that are absolutely certain in life, right? Yep. Um, Lane says there are two things you can't get out of. One is dying, and the other for a woman is if you're pregnant, that baby's coming. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> You can't stop it. That one became something big with her when she was pregnant with Steffi. She started freaking out in labor, and she said, I, I don't want to do this. I, I don't want to do it. And it was funny because I said, honey, you got no choice, and that has stuck with her since. So set up for and frequent flyer accounts. You know what airlines do? They own the miles. You call it your miles, your points, hotel chains, the same thing? No. Their terms of service, they're their miles, their points. Make sure that in your will, believe it or not, in your will, you designate who gets your points with, uh, if you're a frequent traveler, your hotel stay points, your airline points, your car rental points, your points for points, whatever. Make sure that that designation is done, because otherwise those points fly away. I realize in the grieving of somebody gone, that seems kind of trivial to talk about, uh, but I love travel so much that when I've gone to the great beyond, I want to know that uh, my family is enjoying all those points I've accrued. Okay, we'll go to questions now. This is from Donnie in Oregon. I recently requested a credit increase on one of my cards, and being a, the avid Clark listener that I am, my credit is, of course, frozen. I received a notice that a hard inquiry was attempted but denied because of the frozen credit. I then received a letter from card member services that said the freeze would need to be lifted in order for the inquiry to go through. My question is, is it worth a hard inquiry on my credit in order to get a higher credit limit all in order to obtain a higher credit score. Okay, so first of all, there's definitely a um, operational problem at the bank that handles your credit card. Remember this, whoever you have your credit cards with, they have a right to see, even if your credit's frozen, they have a right to see your, your credit standing every single month, and they do. That's why now when you sign into your portal for various credit cards, you can see your up-to-the-minute credit score for free every month. Something started by Discover, and pretty much everybody has done it. Because I remember the Discover CEO said, hey, we're checking everybody's credit score every month. Why not turn it into a benefit? And they made it available. It is lame for your visa issuer to require that you thaw your credit for a credit limit increase, since they already know your score. It's, um, it's a very anti-consumer policy by your financial institution. So is it worth it? Yes. It's worth it for you to temporarily thaw your credit for them to evaluate you for a credit limit increase, because that hard inquiry, unless you're applying for a mortgage in the next six months, that hard inquiry affects your score so little, but the advantage of having the larger credit limit is a big boost over time for your credit score and standing. Judy in Wyoming says, is this Facebook settlement legitimate? And if it is, which payment method do you recommend? Personally, I think the prepaid card would be safest, but wondering about your perspective. It's the Facebook meta privacy settlement. And I did fill this out for myself. I actually chose PayPal since they already have my email address anyway. Uh -huh. um, there are several options, though. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the thing I don't like about the prepaid cards is that there's breakage on them, meaning that they always end up, seems, with a small amount of money you never get around to getting to because you try to use the card and it gets declined. Uh, we've had different suggestions from people about 
using one all for one larger purchase, emptying it out as a partial form of payment. Somebody was talking about how you can do that at Walmart and they use these prepaid cards that they get from uh, retailers and, and uh, settlements and all that at Walmart as a partial and they empty the card and then they go on. I mean, that's a perfectly acceptable way to do or it. Or Amazon.com if you're an Amazon member. Uh, the can, answer to every question is Amazon. Amazon. I know. Um, this is a legitimate settlement because of uh, Facebook was found to be violating people's privacy. Uh, and so it is significant as a real thing. But is the amount of money received significant? How much did you I've get? No, I haven't gotten anything. I just filled it out just to see what it was like. Okay. Um, so we need to close will this. Be small. <laughs> we need to close this loop when you actually get the money. Yeah, it won't be for a while. Okay, but when you do get the money, I'd love to hear what you're actually getting. I will. I'm guessing it's definitely single digits, but we'll see. And this is you mean from in pennies, or you mean in dollars? Dollars, I would guess, a dollar or two, maybe. Let's hope. Bill in Georgia says, Clark, my wife and I are looking to rent a house in West Palm Beach this summer, but the rental company wants a fifteen hundred dollar security deposit in cash personal check or a wire. I've never had to do this before and I don't like the idea of the personal check or wire. Should I be concerned and what would you recommend? Thanks for all you do. And by the way, check out my new Proton email address. I haven't received any spam yet. Cheers. Okay, so let me deal with the last thing first. Proton Mail uh, that I talk about from time to time is a great email service because it's very private and you're not going to get uh, really any spam at all till spammers figure out how to invade your Proton Mail account. They are free and they are very secure, particularly if it's Proton Mail to Proton Mail. Um, it remains almost like a footnote of email services, which is a shame because it's very good. So the risk to you, uh, this uh, real estate company, this management company, you have no idea how ethical they are. They are, um, where are you from? You're from Georgia, there in Florida. If they abscond with your money or you have a dispute about the money, they have possession of it. You have no way to get it back. Um, this, is, this is a risky venture you're entering into, and I don't advise it. I would rather you look at renting a place potentially on Airbnb and rent from one where uh, you have a liberal refund policy. If it says strict refunds, it means you're never going to see any money back, no matter what happens, pretty much. And then you're not going to be put in a vulnerable position of having laid out cash to who knows who, and you may not ever see that money ever again. So I'm with you to be nervous about that. I would not feel comfortable doing it, mm -mm. and I would not send them the $1,500 unless you like seeing your money potentially fly away. And I want to thank you so much for listening or watching today's podcast. We love reading your reviews and the comments you post about our podcast. Have a great day.